Nice to see you again and welcome to another Outdoor Leadership Virtual Fieldwork Program. And today we're going to look at how would you run a cycling trip for a group. And the group is going to be anything that you need it to be. So are you running a trip for a group of stu school students that are doing an outdoor ed program and this is part of a program where they're away somewhere or is this just a half day recreational cycle trip or are you running a program which is training for something like the Great Victorian Bike Ride which is huge in Victoria and or, in fact across Australia now there's bike rides, Great Vic and Great Queensland bike rides where you have up to 10,000 school students spending nine days at the end of the uh, school year in December um, doing a long cycle trip and camping at different country towns along the way. So if you're involved in say teaching, even if you're not the outdoor ed teacher or the phys ed teacher, you're often another one of the teachers who has interest, you may be involved in that. Also there's a lot of cycling programs that are used for um, adventure therapy. And of course there is the whole gamut of touring with cycling and mountain biking and uh, road and sport cycling. So there's a lot of areas. There's also cycling for fitness. So no matter what your group is, and if it's just for your family and friends to go and have a longer trip, we're gonna cover everything that you need to know to take a group cycling. And surprisingly, or maybe actually not surprisingly, all trips require quite a lot of prep and quite a lot of thought before you take off when you lead a group. So let's get started. With every trip that you take, whether it's for family or friends or whether it's for group, whether it's for your work or whether it's for leisure, your primary um, decision will be based around what are you trying to achieve. So in this particular case, what I'm trying to achieve or what I have in mind is what I need you guys to get out of this. So you're my focus. So when you decide what the focus is, what you want your participants to get out of it, that will determine what equipment you need, what sort of bike you're going to use, and where you're gonna go. So in today's case, this is about teaching you how to lead, and it's also about us getting out and having some fun. And we'll get out and have some fun once COVID's over, but in the meantime, we've got to cover off quite a few skills. So I needed to choose an area that had some of the key elements that I wanted to cover with you today so that you're aware of them. So how to run a trip when you're taking a group on a bike path, whether you're taking a group on a road. Um, what are you looking at? Are you gonna go into the mountains and do mountain biking and therefore that's the equipment that you need will have to be different. Are you going on a tour? You need to decide those sorts of things. When you decide those things, then you can choose the area. And then that determines the equipment, and in particular, the bike that you're gonna need, or your group is gonna need. Also, do all your participants have their own bike, or are you going to have to go to a place where you can hire it? A lot of the mountain biking parks now have places where you can hire mountain bikes. And dotted along a lot of the major cities now, you have bike hire, and there's also obviously bike shops that hire out bikes. So for us today, I chose an area that I wanted to include some key things that you needed to understand when leading a group. So different um, terrain, we're going to be doing dirt tracks, we're going to be doing bike paths, we're going to be doing roads, and we're going to be managing groups. We're also going to try and make it so that we tap into public transport to try and reduce our carbon footprint. And today I'm not going to do a loop, but I'm going to use the public transport system, the railway lines, starting at one railway station and finishing another, but moving through a number of different landscapes. We're going to start on coastal landscapes, and then we're going to end in wetlands, wetlands landscapes. So that today determines what equipment, in particular, what bikes you guys or my participants and myself require. You can use any bikes for the terrain we're going to do today. Um, a mountain bike, a hybrid bike, a touring bike, a road bike. Um, and so that broadens it. And there's also a couple of spots along the way where participants could hire bikes if they didn't have access to a bike. And that's pretty important to keep it flexible and trying to make field trips like this keep the costs low so that everybody can participate. Um, super important, super important. So you've got your area that you're gonna go to that predetermines your equipment and then you can get started. So let's get started on the gear you need as a leader. 
once you've decided what you want the group to get out of the program and therefore what you think is appropriate in terms of where you're going to go and what sort of bike you're going to use, there's a couple other considerations that are really important. So what's the fitness level of your group? What is the riding capabilities of your group? And what time frame do you have? Also weather is another consideration obviously. So if you have a time frame which is say a day cycle, which is what we're doing today, your distances can be determined by the terrain. So if it's a hilly terrain, obviously you have to allow more time. Also the size of your group will determine the time. So the ride we're going to do today, if I was riding that completely on my own, with minimal brakes would probably only take two to three hours. But if you take four people on the group, you need to add another 20 minutes. If you take um, eight people in the group, you add another 20 minutes. Uh, you take multiples of four, you should add another 20 minutes. Where did I get that stat from? Experience. So um, in the past, what I've noticed with bushwalking, paddling, uh, cycling, any activities, the more people in the groups, the longer it takes. You, the tail of your group gets further apart, which you need to manage. You need to manage the time that you have for stops. And also you have stops for incidents that happen which aren't necessarily going to occur and drag out the time with smaller groups, such as fixing brakes, punctures, um, people not feeling like they know how to use their gears, those sorts of things. And that will all drag the time out depending on how many group people you've got in your group. So the, tr the, the trip that I've chosen today, as I said, covers a number of different terrains. But what I did is simply plot the distances on Google Map to check that they were doable within the time frame that I wanted to run this trip for. And also to look at the possibilities of distances between stops and availabilities of amenities such as toilet blocks. So th those sorts of things and also water actually is another important one. Those things are important to consider when you're planning your trip. So today's trip is about 30 kilometers. We start at one um, train station. We go to some of the key features. I put a couple of internationally renowned features in there because I know we've got some international students watching today. And it finishes in a completely different type of environment just to change it up a bit. And today was gonna to be a bit colder, but it's actually turned out to be beautiful. So we may be even able to have a swim at the end. We'll see how we go. So once you've got your route planned out, it's suitable, you know that you've got um, availability of the right bikes for your groups, then the other paperwork that you have to have as a leader is exactly the same as I've covered with you before on a number of the trips. You need your risk management protocols, you need your um, medical indemnity forms, and you need your trip notes. So those sorts of things are absolute minimum that you need to carry. As I've said to you before, I often carry them in some sort of waterproof case, in this case a map case. And for me today, I don't necessarily need to take this in a map case because I'm taking everything in a dry bag. For all trips, I tend to put all my gear in dry bags because even when the weather is predicted to be great, it often ends up with some rain. The other thing that I need to think about is what I'm going to carry that gear in as a leader and I have panniers that go on my bike but these are not waterproof so everything will be packed in the dry bag and then in the, to these panniers. If you're leading a group you don't need to carry panniers you can put everything in a day pack but again make sure that it's in something or it has a cover on it so it stays dry but as a leader you will need to take as a minimum a day pack if not panniers if you've got them. The next thing you need to consider as a leader is your comms. So as usual, in the, we're doing a, a ride today that doesn't require a sat phone, so a normal phone will get you through. But if you're leading groups, say you've got a group of, uh, let's say 24, so you've got two groups of 12s with a leader with each group, um, it's quite difficult to be calling to check in with the other leader, and I find two ways are really handy. So I have one leader with one two-way and one leader with another. I use these on ski tours, I use these on cycle trips, bushwalks. We don't, we're not on them all the time, but if the group, group's separated and we're meeting at a lunch spot, we're trying to stay connected, keep the group together, a leader has one of these. They actually have earpieces. You can pop them in here and pop them under your top or your jacket. They're really handy if you've got a group bigger than, um, if you've got to divide a group into two groups. And you need to really cycle or walk or ski with no group more than 10 
students or participants in your group and a leader. So if you have a normal class, which is normally, let's say it's normally about 24, 25, you're going to have at a minimum two leaders and the 10 students in each group or 12 students in each group. So this is, these are really good comms. The other thing, obviously, as a trip leader, you need to take, and I've talked to you about this on many occasions before, is a group first aid kit. Group first aid kit is much bigger than um, your normal personal first aid kit and um, you have your mask as well there's epi pens in there there's everything in there it's actually a really important thing to have for cycling i mean most of the time the worst injury you're going to get is a bit of a graze but if you have anything worse than that it's very good to be carrying that again that's in a dry bag always keep your first aid gear in a dry bag and as a leader you need to carry that the other things that you need to consider as a leader is some additional safety equipment so we have here um, the comms and the phone is a comms, but I have got additional lights that I would put on my bike, um, particularly on the rear. Today it's very sunny, so um, they won't, you won't be able to see these particularly well at all, but as, as often it will cloud over. And yesterday I did a reconnaissance of this walk, uh, walk this cycle, and it started off quite... Uh, sunny and we ended up with very dark clouds some rain and quite dark and the lights were actually very handy by the time we finished later yesterday evening so the lights are important always as a trip leader you should carry a watch uh, this watch will actually measure the distances we're going as well um, inclines all that sort of stuff you don't need anything as fancy as that but you do need something these little uh, bike computers are pretty handy they'll give you average speed they'll give you distance it's only when you're cycling which is good too so you can sort of get a pace for what your group's doing um, and they give you a total overall maximum speed etc you don't need all that sort of stuff but you need some way of obviously keeping track of the time so some lights some way of cap keeping track of the time some comms also, as a leader, you need to have some extra repair gear. You need to have some equipment to... The most common problem that you'll have is a flat tyre. And students whose bikes are not in good nick or participants' bikes who are not in good nick and often their brakes are pinching, that sort of... Those are the two key main things. And also the gears aren't lining up. Particularly also that the gears are... The students don't know how to use the gears and it's worth spending some time going through that and I'll actually do that later on for you so you know what I'm talking about. So a basic repair kit, and I'm talking absolute basic, is um, something that has tyre levers which you can then change the tyre with. It has a multi-tool which has Allen keys and a Phillips head screwdriver this one also has tyre levers, these are Allen keys, it also has tyre levers in here, so a multi-tool, a spare tube, every student needs to carry a spare tube because every repair kit comes with patches which you can glue or stick on and re-put back on, but if you've got a spare tube and you can literally just pull the other one out, and put a new one in, then you can repair the old tube when you get home and you can, don't have to fuss with that. But if they don't have a spare tube, that's a good thing. But a spare tube's really good. And then I always carry an extra multi-tool, one that has sort of pliers, has some extra sharp um, blades and things like that for fixing up gears. So that would be your minimum as a leader that you would need to carry. And all students should also carry a pump. You need to make sure that you've got the right... Um, pump for the right valve so some students will have road bike valves the other ones will have the bigger fatter ones I don't know what they're called um, but you need to make sure you have those and if if the students don't have a pump each you need to make sure there's at least a couple of pumps in your group the other thing is to make sure as a leader I would be taking this if you're starting off somewhere in the car I'd be taking a, a a proper big pump to make sure that everybody's tire pressure is correct before we start um, and this is a much quicker way of doing it. The tire pressures are written on the tires on the wall of the tire and I'll go through that with you a little bit later when we're looking at how to set up your bikes but that would be the minimum. The other safety bit of equipment 
and this again is for each of the students as well as the leader is, a, is simply a little bell. It's actually a requirement by law to have a bell so um, just make sure that at the minimum the student needs is a roadworthy bike, a bell, a spare tube and you can carry the rest for them or have the rest if they don't have that. Other things in terms of leadership is that um, I always carry additional sunscreen for students. Um, it's often something that gets forgotten and particularly on a day like today, I mean we'll be riding for perhaps four hours in the sun, pretty important to have that sunscreen. So in terms of a leader I think we've basically covered off on everything that we need there. And um, I'm just going to go through a bit of personal equipment that the students or participants or your clients would need to, or your family or friends would need to carry with them. So most important thing for safety, number one, you can't ride without it, is your helmet. It's very important that every participant not only has a helmet, you can't, you can't take a group without a helmet. Um, it's, I mean, they're the road rules. Um, it's required by law in Victoria, it's in, required by law in Australia. So I know other countries don't require it, but it's definitely a law in Australia. You need to have a Australian approved standards helmet and you need to make sure it fits the participants properly. The biggest issue that we have most of the time is that they don't fit these properly. And what you need to make sure is that you don't actually need they don't actually need to have this front bit on them if they don't, you know, if their bike doesn't have it. But what they need to do is to make sure that it fits snugly and it does up around the chin with no more than two fingers being able to fit in here. If it gapes down like that, it's too loose and obviously it's obvious when it's too tight and it'll be too uncomfortable. The most common mistake people make is that they wear their helmets like that. If, you, if I came off my helmet, came off my bike now, there's nothing protecting this. This would come off in an instant and there's nothing protecting this. It needs to be fitted so it sits here. And you do that by making sure that these bits here are pulled down over the ear. So as a leader, one of your first responsibilities is to ensure that the helmet is on, it's solid and it's sitting in the right place. On a day like today, if you don't have a peak like this for your helmet, just ask the students to make sure that they wear a peak under their helmet, just to give them that sun protection. It also helps with the glare. And it's sometimes more comfortable for students, particularly if the Velcro underneath here is wearing. So a helmet is your number one factor in terms of safety for your participants and a minimum requirement that you need. The second thing in terms of safety that I would highly recommend, and it doesn't have to be cycling gloves, it can be gardening gloves, whatever, is gloves. The first thing you put down if you come off your bike is your hands. They've done a lot of research on safety equipment for cycling, and gloves is the second most important thing for participants to have other than the helmet. So those are the key things that you need. You need a helmet, hopefully you need gloves, the students definitely need a bell. They're the definites. From there, the rest of the things are optional, but they will make your participants um, have a more comfortable uh, journey if they're warm and dry and protected from the sun. I highly recommend, but certainly I wouldn't recommend going out and buying them, but if you have riding nicks, riding nicks have this padding on the, on the bottom and they do make a huge difference. So I highly recommend if your participants have access to borrow some or if they have them that they wear them. If it's cold you can wear a pair of leggings underneath or over the top but highly recommend those. The other things that you need um, are as a waterproof windproof jacket. The good thing about specific cycling jackets is they have this very long tail. I'll just show you and that tucks right underneath and you get a lot of um, water flicking up off the back of the tyre normally and that protects your back from that. Um, be seen, be safe, they're bright, they're colourful, um, they're, they're super light. They're not great if it's really heavy rain, so if you're actually training a group of students up to do something like the Great Vic bike ride where you're going to be out in 
the weather for nine days. Um, that's a lightweight, windproofish, waterproofish, but it's not amazing at keeping the water or the wind out. So if you're going to be doing a bigger trip or bad weather trip, take a proper breathable lightweight jacket. I would, uh, if I was running a program such as the Great Big Vic Bike Ride, I would insist that students have a proper um, full-on jacket. You can actually buy cycling ones now like this that are Gore-Tex. They're windproof and waterproof for their vis highly vis like this colour and that's a great option. But, you know, it's also expensive. So try and be able to use all sorts of gear for all your different trips. Some additional optional extras, which are certainly not required, but they add to comfort, is these leg, um, not leg, sorry, arm, um, they're not really arm warmers, I don't know what they are, arm um, extension things, that they've got a little grippy Velcro thing there, and it's not Velcro because it would itch, but it's grippy, and it sticks there, so when you're cycling along, if you're getting hot, you don't necessarily have to stop, you can literally just pull these off, and a lot of cycling jackets have pockets just in the back, and you can just pop them in the back there. The other thing I would recommend your students wear is breathable collared top if it's warm. You need a breathable for obvious reasons. Collared because you're spending a lot of time with this area very exposed to the sun. So something breathable that covers up this and protects you from the sun is important. If it's cold, um, some sort of merino or thermal top. You can wear that actually under something like this and then layer it off as you go during the day. No cotton. Same. It's the same with every activity. Ski touring, walking, paddling. No cotton. No cotton, no cotton, no cotton. Okay? Thermals, wool, something that will wick and something that will um, dry quickly. And obviously when you're stopping um, you cool down very quickly, so a lightweight, again, breathable, lightweight, um, quick wicking, warm jacket is important. And again, pop them all in some sort of dry bag, unless you have a waterproof. Some panniers now, or oh, actually a lot of panniers now, are waterproof. So, you know, if you've got the money and you want to spend, get a waterproof pannier, you won't have to layer everything in dry bags. Fairly important. Some other additional extras, which again aren't really necessary, but they're good if you're doing... Uh, a lot of training for, say, a bigger cycle trip and you're doing it in winter. It's amazing because your feet aren't really moving. I mean, your legs are moving, but your feet aren't. Your feet get very cold and they get a lot of wind on them as well. So these little covers help you with that. And they have a bit out there. And then, sorry about my old dilapidated cycling shoes, but um, shoes with cleats. These ones are uh, multi-purpose they're not the full-on cycling ones which you can't walk in um, these are a cross cycling shoe and they have a cleat underneath when you cleat onto the, my um, pedals have two options I can cleat in or not and these are great because you can still walk on wear them as uh, like runners you can walk with them but they cleat onto your pedals and that actually is uh, efficient in terms of power driving through your pedals because you don't have any slack um, and all the power gets driven through here and obviously the balls of your feet are where your foot is meant to be on the pedal anyhow so it's pretty important um, that even if the kids or your participants or your friends and family don't have they just have runners which is totally fine that you identify and explain to them that they should have the that pad the balls of their feet on the pedal not the arches not the toes um, and that's where you get the main drive for your power it's the most efficient way to pedal so pretty important so some decent shoes in, in terms of personal gear and then last but not least is of course a group a, a personal first aid kit on a little day a cycle like we have today a little first aid with um, personal medication and some stuff for scratches and a bit of gravel rash is fine or something um, if it's longer trips a personal first aid kit like that would be fine and then some food food and water really important so if you don't have somewhere where the group can stop to fill up you need to make sure that you've got at least a couple of lots of water um, and a lot of the bikes have double brackets on them where you can carry extra water or you can put an extra one in your pannier you need some food I had a little Easter egg here to share with you, but he's liquid now, been in the sun. A few nuts, a little bit of chocolate as a treat is good. Again, particularly um, for cycling, you need some sort of glasses 
The reason for that is you get lots of bugs, lots of bugs in your eyes, so you definitely need eye protection. Um, I always um, wear a lot of protection on my lips because I, I get burnt on my lips very, a lot, very quickly. So those sorts of things are super important. And again, I carry them all, you know, with some money and everything in a dry bag. So I think, if I just check here, I've covered it off on everything that you need to know in terms of what to carry and safety equipment for your cycling. So we'll get that packed and then I'm just going to go briefly through what you need to consider in terms of the setup of your bikes for your participants and we'll head off.